Okay, it looks like we hit about critical mass. So once again, my name is Sean Vidka. I'm with Demand Progress. Um, I helped set this up uh, and I'm very happy that all of you were able to join us and in particular our panelists who uh, I'm gonna try to stay out of the way of and invite them to share their wisdom with you. Um, to start, I wanna thank uh, in particular the people who are making this uh, event possible, representatives Davidson, Jacobs, Mace, uh, Jayapal, Armstrong, Lofgren, Klein, Escobar, Buck, Hoyle, Tenney, uh, Barbara Lee, Biggs, and Castro um, who have offered this amendment. As you can tell, this is an incredibly bipartisan list, and this may be the most bipartisan issue in Congress. Um, and that's actually just the 30 seconds that I have here before we kick things off where I want to spend spend my moment. Um, I think that we are incredibly fortunate to live in a society where when trust is maybe the hardest to find and bipartisanship uh, at its uh, rarest, um, that the thing that comes out as something we can all focus on and cherish and prioritize and work to strengthen are the protections we have for each other. Um, I think that's a real asset to the system that we're all trying to improve every day here. Um, and I hope that that will help guide us all as the rest of this year plays out. Um, but with that said, we're here to talk specifically about the NDAA amendment that's been offered. Um, we're going to have the panelists uh, have a, a discussion in about uh, a little under 10 minutes, but I wanted to start us uh, with uh, something from our friends at the Electronic uh, Privacy Information Center, EPIC. Um, they have spent a lot of time uh, looking at exactly this issue, as have all of our panelists. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is this uh, proliferation of reporting uh, in various forms, sometimes government transparency, sometimes investigative journalists. Um, basically revealing that the government uh, sometimes purchases information about people in the United States. Um, this practice has grown, um, but there was major news uh, a few weeks ago, um, which I have invited Chris from Epic to, to fill you all in on. And this is critical context. This might be the biggest new news about this. And so we wanted to just spend a few minutes going over some key findings before uh, we dived uh, uh, fully in with the whole panel. So with that, I'm gonna uh, hush up and invite Chris to take over. Hi, Sean, thank you for, for bringing me in. Everyone, my, my name is Chris Baumol. I am a law fellow at Epic, um, working on national security surveillance issues. Um, so yeah, well, you know, as Sean mentioned, there, there's been some big news in this space last month in response to congressional oversight and a FOIA request from EPIC, um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, released a partially declassified report from an advisory group about the government's purchase of Americans' information, sometimes in bulk, from data brokers. So this practice of buying information from data brokers that traditionally requires obtaining a court order is what we call the data broker loophole. So I'd like to briefly highlight several of the key takeaways from the report, which as Sean mentioned, I think is critical context for this amendment and this discussion. So first, the report found that intelligence agencies are purchasing vast amounts of information from data brokers, including sensitive information like location data, but do not know how much data they are purchasing, what types, or even what they are doing with that information. As the report concludes, quote, today, in a way that far fewer Americans seem to understand, and even fewer of them can avoid, commercially available information includes information on nearly everyone that is of a type and level of sensitivity that historically could have been obtained, if at all, only through targeted and predicated collection. So this includes location information, information about a person's religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, their mental and physical health, political affiliations, and much more. And the government has taken advantage of the proliferation and sale of this information to circumvent traditional constitutional and statutory constraints on government acquisition of Americans' information. So the panelists after me will explain in more detail why this information is so sensitive. But as the report underscores, the collection and retention of this data raises significant risks of harm to an individual's reputation, emotional well-being, or physical safety, potentially exposing them to blackmail, stalking, harassment, or public shaming. And examples abound of government agents abusing their access to sensitive databases, including by searching for love interests, victims of crime, journalists, protesters, and even politicians. Simply put, 
the government cannot effectively protect Americans' privacy from the grave risks posed by these purchases when it doesn't even know which agencies are buying what information about Americans or what agencies are doing with the sensitive information. This is not just a privacy issue, it's a good governance issue. Without knowing what it's purchasing, it's hard for the government to assure the American people that these purchases are useful, much less necessary, rather than a privacy invasive waste of taxpayer funds. Second, the report found that there are no consistent standards and procedures governing the purchase and use of this information by intelligence agencies. While some agencies have updated their procedures to provide some minimal safeguards concerning the purchase and use of this information, the report makes clear that we're still essentially in the Wild West, with each agency essentially left to write its own rules. These procedures are particularly lacking when it comes to Americans' most sensitive information, and nowhere is this clearer than with location information. Despite a 2018 Supreme Court decision in a case called Carpenter versus United States, which requires a warrant for persistent location information, agencies have no unified position on or understanding of how the right to privacy applies to this sensitive information. To the extent that agencies have divulged any formal position on these questions, it is only that they construe this decision to still allow the government to purchase this information. As data brokers collect even more types of sensitive information, such as biometrics, internet records, the risks to privacy and civil liberties posed by the government's purchase of information will only get more serious. Data brokers acquire more and more information on all of us each day. Data brokers sell more types of information about us each day. And more and more government agencies buy information about us from data brokers without a warrant each day. Overall, the ODNI report confirms what privacy and civil liberties groups have feared for years, that government agencies continue to evade constitutional and statutory protections by purchasing Americans' sensitive information, and that there are few, if any, safeguards in place. These findings underscore the urgency of the years-long effort by members of Congress to address the government's data broker loophole. EPIC applauds Representatives Davidson and Jacobs and every co-sponsor of this critical NDAA amendment for their work to close this loophole. Thank you, Sean. Back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so I want to obviously turn to the panel. Um, I think you can see them all on your screen now, uh, but I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves and uh, uh, I almost called this an icebreaker, but uh, nobody likes icebreakers and it's not an icebreaker. So uh, ignore what I didn't say. But um, I do want every panelist to offer to you, uh, everybody in the audience here, just one critical piece of context they think that you need to know going into this discussion. Um, and I don't want to think about it too hard there. Um, I'm going to go in the following order. Uh, Liza, James, Kia, and then Chairman Goodlatte. Um, so Liza, um, why don't you kick us off? What is one thing that you think everybody should know going into this discussion? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Liza Goitin, Senior Director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. And the key piece of context that I think is important to know is that the laws that are on the books to protect Americans' privacy, uh, the laws that we think are protecting our privacy, are not. And that's because those laws, including actually the case law interpreting the Fourth Amendment, uh, are old, in some cases, many decades old. And you've heard it said many times that the law fails to keep up with technology. The government's ability to use digital data brokers to get around the Fourth Amendment and other legal protections is a prime example of this phenomenon. And if we wait for the courts to come in and solve this problem, we'll be waiting a very long time. Thank you, Liza. And sorry, can you also just introduce yourself? I'm sorry if I missed that, but I want to make sure everybody knows where you. you. That's oh, where I started. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Well, uh, James, please, would you take us to the next point? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. I'm James Chernowski. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Tech and Innovation at Americans for Prosperity. And I think that the critical thing to understand when we're looking at this conversation is just that this is, a, this is going to be an issue that's only going to increasingly become a problem. Kind of as Chris outlined with that ODNI report, the types of data that data brokers collect is very vast, whether that's your, your, um, your homeowner or renter status, income levels, notably 
uh, people with anxiety and depression. That was certainly something that was covered by the press. Um, I think that these are all very sensitive areas of information that the government you know, could be buying up information on. It's available there via the data brokers. Um, every single day, about 329 million terabytes worth of data is generated. And as we're looking to the future, uh, which is going to increasingly have more digital natives, that number is only going to continue to go up, which means that this problem is only going to be amplified. So I think that that's really the big thing that we need to be aware of as we're looking at this conversation here. Thank you so much, James. Um, Kia. Thanks, Sean. I'm, I'm Kia Hamadachi. I'm a senior federal policy counsel with the ACLU. And I, I think what's really important about this is there's not supposed to be an end around the Fourth Amendment. This is data that you would otherwise need a warrant. And what we're seeing, and there are tons of examples of this, is, is law enforcement and government agencies purchasing this data that they otherwise wouldn't be able to acquire. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that's complete end around in terms of what the Fourth Amendment is supposed to stand for. And this is a huge, huge loophole that, unless we address it, is is only going to grow. Like we 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 we've, we've only scratched the surface on on this, and you know, in 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 the in the coming years, if we don't do anything about this, we're only going to see uh, worse and worse examples than what we've seen so far. Thank you, Kia. Co common thread, uh, unfortunate as is, between your and James's points. Um, Chairman Goodlatte, would you like to wrap us up for this section? Sure. So I'm Bob Goodlatte. I'm the senior policy advisor for the Project for Privacy and Surveillance Accountability, a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to promoting and protecting Americans' privacy and reforming government surveillance. And I also served as a member of Congress for 26 years and as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, the key point that I want to leave uh, everyone with uh, at the outset here, and I'll have a lot more to say about it in, in just a second, is there are real world consequences that government can do with this information. And that puts it in contrast with what can be done in the commercial sector, can even in contrast to what can be done with other governments outside of the United States getting this information. Both of those are also huge problems. Uh, there's legislation pending in the Congress right now to address the issue of data brokers selling data to foreign governments, and we definitely need to address that. And there is definitely a need to review uh, the sale of uh, data to uh, uh, private companies and individuals for private and commercial purposes. But today we need to focus on what our government does with this information and the consequences of that. Thank you so much. Um, and before I'm gonna turn back to you in a, in a moment, Chairman Goodlatte, but uh, I wanted to flag two things quickly. One, um, somebody asked helpfully if the ODNI report that Chris was going over is available to the public. Uh, yes, the, it is a declassified version. I answered it in the uh, chat. I believe everybody has access to that, but uh, just send me a note if you don't. Um, and secondly, relatedly, uh, obviously this is a broad coalition. Um, everybody involved in this work uh, is happy to, to work with you directly. Uh, I'm happy to connect you to anybody on this panel or, or otherwise. So please consider this also, uh, you know, the opening uh, opening of a conversation. Uh, if we haven't worked with you before, um, we're eager to do so going forward. Uh, so I want to turn uh, from the those really helpful points that are, are all critical context uh, and start to dive into some of the meat. And there's a lot of meat on the substance uh, side of this. There's meat to the, the politics of it. Um, and frankly, I don't think there's anything simple about this year. Uh, so there's a lot more to discuss beyond those two facets. But um, Chairman Goodlatte, I, I'd like to build out the point that you made about this opportunity. Um, you, you have a lot of experience uh, and just visibility into legislating around these issues. Why do you think of, what? how do you see this particular NDAA amendment and what do you see that's different or unique or so important as you were saying? Well, this amendment is particularly important because it begins a process that is going to go on for the rest of this year. Uh, government surveillance reform uh, is something that is going to be the center of attention for the Congress because a major provision of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Section 702, expires at the end of the year. Uh, when that happens, it's important that the Congress not only address many needed reforms to 702, but that they also address workarounds of the Fourth Amendment that take place when one avenue of surveillance is closed off. We saw that with Section 215 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It expired three years ago. Many people thought, well, 
that's a major victory for civil liberties since no longer can government use that provision to seize uh, data held by third parties. Well, uh, guess what? It looks like the government barely even hit a speed bump in that process. And they now use executive orders. They use 702 itself, the backdoor search opportunity there. And they purchase data from, uh, from data brokers. And so it's really important that we address that uh, and that this amendment uh, provide the initial momentum going into that debate in the fall. So in addition to what I'm about to say about why this is this amendment itself is important. I think it's really important that everyone in our audience here, if they agree with this purpose and this cause, let the rules committee know, let leadership in both parties know that they want this amendment made in order so it can be voted on on the floor of the house. Now, um, I wanna take you right back to the beginning. We wouldn't have a country because if we hadn't been uh, uh, given a bill of rights uh, enough colonies would not have ratified it to perform, to create uh, the uh, uh, original, uh, con you know, the, the, the Constitution of the United States. So uh, I'm going to read that very brief provision, Amendment 4, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. As Liza noted, uh, courts over time for a long time moved towards saying, well, if it's held by a third party, um, it's not covered by the Fourth Amendment. Now the Supreme Court is finally moving back in the right direction. But the importance of building on the Fourth Amendment and protecting the Fourth Amendment, and that's the responsibility of Congress to do, is to make sure that the kind of abuses that occurred before our country was created with British soldiers invading houses and seizing persons and seizing papers and so on is what led to the writing of the Fourth Amendment. And it's important now to take note of the fact that no private party, when we talk about the sale of commercial data, uh, can break down your door at dawn, can take you out in handcuffs, fine you, enjoin you, restrain you, tax you, and deprive you of liberty, and yes, even life, like government can do with information that they improperly, I would argue, seize, uh, and now simply purchase. So that's the Fourth Amendment, and uh, the government has effectively added to the Fourth Amendment uh, one little provision and that is unless we buy it. All those restrictions, all those limitations on getting access to your personal information, unless we buy it. And then uh, the uh, director of national intelligence uh, told um, uh, Senator Wyden, um, of, of, uh, he said the defense, national, the defense intelligence agency informed his office it does not have to adhere to the constitution or the Carpenter Carpenter ruling, which Liza, I'm sure, is going to talk about more, when it buys data. That's an outrageous position that government takes. Uh, it's a position taken no matter what political party is in, in control of the administration. Uh, and it needs to be closed. It needs to be stopped. And this amendment is the first step in doing that. Thank you so much, Chairman. Um, I, I, I think there's a, a lot to pull out of there and I'm looking forward to doing so. Uh, on that note, if folks have questions, feel free to just send them in. Um, the, the question and answer is for a congressional staff. So uh, if you can please uh, self-limit to that, um, feel free to send them in and we'll start threading them into this conversation as quickly as possible. Um, but before we do that, uh, Chairman Goodlatte was exactly right. Uh, Liza, I was about to turn to you to ask if you could tell us um, uh, you know, or give us an example of the government using data brokers to get around the law. Um, uh, both Chris and Chairman Goodlatte referenced uh, uh, Carpenter v. U.S. Um, tell us everything you can about that, because I don't know, I, I think those, that's all critical to approaching this, uh, this issue. Right, that, that's exactly right, Sean. Uh, I wanna focus on geolocation information. That's a particularly sensitive type of information that was at the heart of the Supreme Court's decision in 2018 in Carpenter versus United States. That was an extremely significant decision because before that case, 
the general rule was that people do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that they voluntarily disclose to a third party, such as a cell phone company. That's called the third party doctrine, and it was established by the Supreme Court in the 1970s. Now, whatever merit this doctrine might have had in the 1970s, it makes no sense at all in the digital era. Documents that you once stored in a file cabinet in your office are now backed up to the cloud where they're accessible by your cloud service provider. Searches of card catalogs in a local library have become internet searches, generating search and web browsing records that are stored by your internet service providers. And while once upon a time it was possible to pay a private visit to someone, today, our cell phones, and therefore our cell phone service providers, know where we are at any moment, whether we are visiting a public park or a therapist or Alcoholics Anonymous. So it is effectively impossible to go 24 hours in the digital era without sharing a wealth of personal information uh, with the various third parties that manage life in the digital world. The Supreme Court uh, basically recognized this reality in Carpenter, and it held that police officers needed a warrant uh, in order to obtain a week's worth of cell phone location information from a cell phone company, even though the defendant had voluntarily shared his location information with that cell phone company. The court reasoned first that this information uh, could reveal such exquisitely sensitive details of a person's private life, a historical record of where you have been at every moment, uh, can tell the government about your associations, your habits, even your beliefs. Moreover, the court pointed out that sharing this information with your cell phone company is not exactly voluntary in a meaningful sense of the word, because the only alternative is to forgo using a cell phone and therefore forgo participation in modern life. Privacy advocates hailed this decision, not just because it meant that this very sensitive type of data would now be protected by a warrant, or so we thought, uh, but also because it signaled that the court might be willing to extend Fourth Amendment protections to other types of highly sensitive data that are stored by third parties, such as internet search records. Fast forward to 2021, and we started seeing news reports from investigative journalists that federal agencies were purchasing cell phone location information, the very information that was at the heart of Carpenter. And we're not talking about a few records here and there of individuals who were suspects in particular investigations. We are talking about agencies purchasing access to databases, including cell phone location information of thousands or even millions of Americans. Federal agencies that have bought this type of information or bought access to it uh, include the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Customs and Border Protection, the Secret Service, the Department of Defense, and even the IRS. So given the ruling of, in Carpenter, how is it possible for the government to obtain American cell phone information, sometimes in massive amounts, without any legal process whatsoever, let alone a warrant? The answer in short is that government lawyers have interpreted Carpenter as applying only when the government compels the production of information. When the, government merely, when the government merely incentivizes that production by writing a big check, the warrant requirement conveniently disappears according to the government. Now, I think that that's legal sophistry, but it could take the courts many years to resolve that question. In the meantime, there are laws that limit these types of purchases, but these laws are woefully outdated, and as a result, they include gaping loopholes. Take, for example, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA, which prohibits internet and phone companies from voluntarily disclosing or selling customer records to government agencies. This prohibition does not extend to digital data brokers uh, or to many types of app developers, simply because those entities did not exist in 1986, which is when the law was passed. So companies that are prohibited from selling your information to the government can instead sell it to a data broker. And the data broker can turn around and sell that very same information to the government at a handsome profit. So the information is effectively laundered through a middleman. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, for its part, uh, also appears to include some robust protections. It provides that FISA uh, and certain provisions of the criminal law 
are the exclusive means by which the government may conduct electronic surveillance. But electronic surveillance is defined in a complex matter, in a complex way uh, that is keyed to the modes of communication and collection that existed in 1978. And it leaves room for the government to access uh, certain types of Fourth Amendment protected information, including geolocation information, complete, completely outside the strictures of FISA or the criminal law, including through data broker purchases. So this leaves us in a situation where the government is evading the Fourth Amendment and none of the privacy laws in place today are sufficient to prevent this undermining of our constitutional rights. And that's why Congress needs to pass this amendment uh, to close the legal, le legal loopholes that are allowing the government to use data brokers, uh, as Kia said, as an end run around the Fourth Amendment and other legal protections. Thank you so much, Liza. Um, it is always great to have uh, everybody on this panel, but uh, it is uh, just a, a tremendous honor to get to work with Liza because she is such a resource on all of these deep questions. And so um, thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope everybody will will reach out and follow up with you uh, if they have any more questions. Um, James, I wanted to turn to you. Uh, obviously, the the legal analysis here you know, is, is more than we can do in one hour in any event, although I think Liza just did an incredible job uh, encapsulating it. But tell us what it's what what, what does this mean uh, in terms of constituents? What, how do how do the how do the American people feel about this? How does this land with them? What what does this look like from the purview of somebody who who isn't you know deep in the weeds? Yeah, uh, as somebody who's definitely not a lawyer in training, uh, I certainly defer to the lies on that analysis, which was great. But I think that when you're looking at this issue fundamentally, and and this is something that I think that we've seen kind of occur and arise thematically within the broader conversation around FISA 702 and the FBI um, and these agencies. It's just that, um, you know, these agencies are all mission oriented. They're supposed to protect and serve if, if it's the FBI and prevent and protect us from things. But I think that what ultimately ends up happening is that when you have these instances kind of come up that Liza's highlighted, that Chris was highlighting, it undermines trust of the American people that we place in these respective agencies and institutions to keep us safe. Because rather than protecting us, people might feel like they're getting persecuted. And that's that's actually not an okay place to be. I think that um, this is why when like Liza's talking about Carpenter, uh, Samuel Alito in that decision had recognized, I think, correctly that, you know, this is somewhere where the courts can't keep up with it, uh, that this is something where legislatures need to go and act. And we've certainly seen some stuff on this trying to tackle that issue at the state level. But truly, I think the biggest bite at the apple lies here at the federal level when we're talking about um, the government being able to buy this data and then by extension, what it's able to do with that information uh, because it is so vast. So I think that, again, you want to get to a place where we can restore trust in these institutions. And the nice thing about this amendment, which is bipartisan in nature, is that it really is that first step in a long process of trying to have the American public's trust get restored in these critical institutions. Thank you so much, James. And actually, I'd like to pull one one more thing here. You know, the Liza mentioned that we started seeing reporting about these issues. I think maybe 2021 was the year that you mentioned, and, and that sounds about right to me. Uh, James, I'm curious if you have thoughts on, you know, th there are there are a lot of different ways in which uh, these agencies uh, have lost trust over the last number of years. Can you speak any more as to what you think is most informative there and how you think the the way that we keep finding out about this type of surveillance, especially on the warrantless surveillance side, does that factor in here? Yeah, I think that it absolutely does. I think it's impossible to ignore that when you get a new report about, you know, the FBI looking at, um, you know, protesters at January 6th or the Black Lives Matter protesters, um, you know, those kinds of things coming out and the manner in which it happens, it all goes and undermines Americans' trust. You know, these these agencies, you know, especially if you're looking at the national security context, it's supposed to be protecting us from foreign threats. And, you know, I think that this administration particularly has had a message of talking about how domestic terrorism is the largest threat that we face, which is all fine and dandy if, if we accept that to be true. Uh, when you're talking about domestic issues, the Constitution comes into place and the constraints that follow it, too. And when you have these stories pop up again and again and again, it just really makes, I think, Americans wonder, well, what's going on here? Why does it seem like these rules are not able to be followed? Um, and it really does, I think, put a big rift into the ability of them to go and have trust in these institutions or think that the system's actually operating as it's intended to do so. So I think that, again, it's just one of those things where 
you know, the public is feeling left out of the loop. Um, they feel like there's not enough transparency and accountability for the government when it is going and violating and breaching that trust that we have. And that's why something like this is very critical. So I'm, I know that we're certainly very happy to see that these members of Congress are willing to put this amendment forward. Thank you, James. And it brings to mind, uh, I think Chairman Goodlatte referenced this as well. There was a, a during the Senate side uh, worldwide threats hearing, um, I, I believe uh, Director Ray, uh, you, you know, was finally kind of confronted with a, a narrow question of has the FBI bought location information about people in the United States? And his answer was, uh, we, we did once, you know, as though as though the fact that it had happened, uh, you know, without anybody's permission uh, outside of the executive branch, um, you know, was the defense that it had already maybe ended, maybe it wasn't uh, uh, something they had turned into a full blown operational program right then in that moment. But of course, it does tell us that the legal legal question has presented itself. Um, Liza, uh, please, uh, I know you wanted to jump in yeah. here about transparency. Yeah. Yeah, all, all I wanted to say is that <clears throat> we started hearing about these purchases and, and the news reports started coming out two years ago. And for two years, the government was silent on this, even though uh, it was clearly happening. Uh, there was clearly a need for transparency and an explanation uh, of why this is happening, how this is happening, what sorts of protections might be in place. And literally two years of just silence and, and forcing the American public and lawmakers too, to rely on what investigative journalists managed to figure out. And now finally, you know, we get this, we, you know, a, a statement here and there in a hearing, and then we get this, this report um, that the ODNI declassified and made public, but even that is not an ODNI report. That's a report of an advisory group that ODNI put together. Uh, we still don't have any kind of official statement uh, from the executive branch about going on here and, 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 and how they're using this information, what their practices are. I, I mean, I guess we have a hint from this advisory group report that they don't really know what they're doing. So maybe that's part of it. Uh, but anyway, this, this is uh, really an inexcusable lack of transparency by the government on this. And I think that has to inform this, this question of, can we really just trust the government to keep doing this without any kind of uh, legislative guardrails? Thank you. And, and just to offer a, just a little bit of uh, chronological context there, I, you know, Liza, definitely, I definitely agree with everything Liza just said, but, you know, we're talking about since 2021 in terms of the reporting, uh, USV Carpenter is a 2018 uh, holding, right? And so, so these, these questions, uh, the, the answers to these questions were, were clearly in need the day that opinion came out, if not earlier. Um, and then, of course, how, how much farther back uh, one goes uh, is, is, well, it's a, maybe that's for another discussion because that might take a minute. Um, Kia, uh, I want to get to you. So uh, obviously the ACLU uh, is, is, is probably the biggest grassroots organization involved in this fight, or at least one of them. Um, I wanted to you know, partially pull back to James's point uh, or, or some of what James was saying in terms of how this interacts um, or, or how this uh, impacts constituents um, and, and how, I guess, just the grassroots uh, 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 members that ACLU represents, um, you know, feel about this issue. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here. So I kind of want to just give you the floor. Um, please take it away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this issue obviously touches on a lot of things that grassroots people who, who are members of the ACLU, ACLU uh, really much care about. But I think that whether you are on the right or the left, this is a, this implicates an issue that you care about, right? There are potential uses here when it comes to abortion, when it comes to gun rights, when it comes to immigration. Um, you know, data brokers have a massive amount of data they they they, they advertise that are for sale. Like, for instance, one in where certain users visit health clinics or which reproductive traffic tr uh, tracking apps are installed. Um, they sell information on people's immigration status. They 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 offer information on people's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, income, political, and religious affiliation. Um, there's there's their, their data brokers who openly advertise um, the data on in America's interest on political organizations and causes. And you know that that's whether you support the ACLU, whether you support Planned Parenthood, or whether you support uh, the NRA. Right? It's 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 an issue that no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, there is a potential for it to be used against on a uh, about something that you care about you know and 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 i think you know you know in, in the 702 context we've seen we've seen um, a lot of abuses from the fbi you know whether it's searching black Lives matters activists whether it's searching people who are involved in january 6th 
And I, th I think when we think of law enforcement, we think of the government. Well, why, why we, have, we have to think about, you know, why would they just be, you know, they're not just going to limit themselves to 702. To the extent that there's information available to them in the, uh, in the data purchase, con in, in the context of data purchases along these same issue lines, um, unless we provide some sort of limitation, like there is absolutely a potential for abuse, as we've seen over and over in a number of different contexts. Thank you, Kia. And, and I, I guess I want to um, flag one thing for, for the audience here. You know, we, we I'm going to de de describe two brief categories here. One is, uh, you know, a set of, of invasions of privacy of searches for information about people in the United States, uh, you know, that that people on this panel don't think should be occurring or is bad policy, but maybe isn't illegal. Uh, and then there's a category uh, shy of that, that is, no, everybody kind of acknowledges that this is unlawful um, and problematic in one one or more ways. Um, I think every example you have heard so far, Kia referenced, for instance, uh, uh, something that had also been brought up earlier about um, searches for information about January 6th suspects and also Black Lives Matter protesters. That's from a single FISA court opinion. And it is uh, recognizing that those were all unlawful queries based on the government's own rules. Uh, so that's as implemented, um, you know, the authority in question there is section 702, but that's as implemented in reality, uh, not working, right? Those are, those are violations of uh, existing policy, not even what we're trying to uh, uh, talk through now with this amendment or or this year more generally. Um, I uh, want to return to encourage uh, people in the audience to submit questions. Um, and I'm going to invite uh, everybody on the panel to uh, kind of identify a key takeaway that they think everybody should have. We have a little bit of time here, which is really nice. Um, and so before that, I'm gonna try to turn to a few of the questions that have already come in. Uh, if that's okay with folks. And I'll invite um, everybody to jump in. And actually, I want to invite Chris from Epic to turn his camera back on because uh, maybe some of these questions will make sense for him. Uh, and he's more than welcome to jump in as well. Um, so, uh, well, actually, the first one might, I'm going to, I'm going to actually start with Chris on this one, but everybody else can jump in if they'd like. Um, somebody asked uh, earlier in the panel, I hope they're still around, uh, who p purchased the information? I think this is rel relative to the uh, ODNI report, um, but obviously we're all talking about uh, 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 the same universe of 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 who who did what. So, Chris, do you want to start us off, and then anybody else who wants to add in can jump in. Yeah, of course. So, the short answer, based on the ODNI report, is we still don't really know. Um, the ODNI itself, the intelligence community writ large, has no inventory of which agencies are purchasing which data. Some of that information is available on um, public websites like SAM.gov. You know, examples included in the report are FBI, DIA, the Coast Guard, um, DHS INA, which is the investigator, investigatory arm of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but the answer really is everyone. Um, you know, we certainly don't have full um, exposure and, and transparency about who's buying what. The government doesn't know. Um, but I, I think the question is really who isn't buying data because the, the uh, report makes clear that the rules are such that if you say that it's relevant to your mission, you can go ahead and buy it. Thank you, Chris. Does anybody else want to jump in here? And I uh, just pulling out the exact names that I think Chris touched on FBI, DHS. Um, actually, I'm just going to add some more. I think IRS, I don't remember if you mentioned that, Chris, uh, we know has bought this information. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Oh, CIA. Uh, Secret Service, uh, you know, very, Department of Defense, including the DIA Defense Intelligence Agency, as Chris mentioned, um, and other, the other components of DHS in addition to INA, the uh, I, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Protection. And uh, this will become relevant to the third question that we haven't gotten to quite yet, but uh, our, our colleagues over at the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, EFF, had, uh, uh, I think last year, some, some great reporting. Basically, they did uh, submitted uh, 
uh, freedom of information requests to a large number of local law enforcement um, and found, I think, 18 different, uh, uh, you know, municipal or state level uh, law enforcement entities that were also buying this information similarly. So, um, you know, I think Chris did a really good job of describing this is this is already a broad practice. Uh, and we have every reason to think that it is growing quicker than um, any kind of overseer can keep up with, which uh, I think speaks to the need for Congress to weigh in here. Um, thank you so much for that uh, and adding in, Liza. Um, so uh, the next question is actually, I think, two really good questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna break it in half because I, I could imagine maybe be having different folks answer. Um, to any of the participants, uh, how would you reconcile? Uh, the idea that the bill would uh, give a potentially unfair advantage to foreign intelligence agencies. Um, I'd love to jump in. I know uh, Chairman Govat also will, will have something to say on this as well, but I, I just want to jump in and say that um, we have to understand that our government is bound by the Fourth Amendment and is bound to respect the, the privacy and constitution, constitutional rights and civil liberties of American citizens. Other governments are not bound to respect that, unfortunately. Um, that does not mean that we need to participate in a race to the bottom where we jettison our rights so that our government has the same access to our personal lives that foreign governments uh, might have. That, that is not the solution. And as Chairman Goodlatte pointed out earlier, there are all kinds of reasons why US government intrusions on our privacy and access to that information uh, can harm us in, in, in ways that foreign governments access to the information uh, cannot. So uh, it, it's a problem. We need to address it. We are, there are bills that are pending in Congress that uh, I would be happy to discuss with, with anyone who wants to discuss that would actually sort of get at this problem in a more sort of comprehensive way. Uh, but in terms of the immediate uh, need to make sure that the government is, expect, is respecting uh, American civil liberties, um, I think that is a uniquely pressing issue uh, that we need to address right away. Elias is exactly right. This is about a government spying on its own people. Uh, and that is, in my opinion, uh, a most alarming thing. Yes, I'm concerned about uh, the Chinese government or other foreign governments wanting to gather information about American citizens. And that also can be addressed by those of you who are concerned about it by supporting the legislation introduced by Senator Wyden in the Senate. And I think there's a counterpart in the House of Representatives as well. Uh, and I think there should be concern about the proliferation of information, your private information in, in the commercial marketplace as well. But none of that pertains to the Fourth Amendment, which applies to governments in the United States. It doesn't apply to private company getting information about you. It doesn't apply even to a foreign government, but the Fourth Amendment, the United States Constitution, protects you from unlawful and unreasonable searches and seizures. And this is uh, based upon the Carpenter decision opening the door. This is a form of that type of seizure. Yes, you pay cold, hard cash for it instead of breaking down a door and getting the information. But what you can do with that information is truly frightening. Uh, and if the government continues to buy information and store it in large databases or has subscriptions uh, to databases that they can tap into at any time they want, how are we distinguish ourselves from the Chinese government, which we know does just that with regard to its citizens? Uh, this is a government uh, that is supposed to honor the freedom uh, of its citizens, and it's not doing that when it purchases data. Uh, that it otherwise would be required to comply with the Fourth Amendment and get a warrant in order to obtain. So that's why I think it's so, so important that an amendment like this pass. Uh, and the first step, of course, is to make sure that it's made in order. Uh, you have a fantastic list of, um, of uh, members on both sides of the aisle uh, who've offered this amendment. Uh, surely it should be made in order so that all members of Congress have the opportunity to vote on this question. There's one very quick addition to, to that. This distinction between uh, companies, uh, between government agencies obtaining this information and other people somehow obtaining this information is already baked into the statutory law. So if you look at ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, it prohibits phone and internet companies from disclosing certain types of customer records to government agencies. Um, that, that same prohibition doesn't, doesn't exist for, for other uh, entities to whom 
the data might be disclosed. So there's already this understanding sort of within statutory law, as well as obviously baked into the Fourth Amendment, that government access uh, is uniquely uh, problematic and uh, carries the potential for abuse. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be looking at the ability of uh, of uh, companies to sell their data to other companies or to individuals. That's true. But that's a separate issue. This is an opportunity to protect the Fourth Amendment uh, and to protect citizens from the abuse uh, of their rights when government gathers data like this and then can act upon it. Uh, and there are already examples of parallel construction where information is gathered from one source. And then if that information is not admissible in court, and I, there's nothing that I know of that doesn't make this information even admissible in court right now, but if they gather it that way, then they simply construct another means of then going after an individual. That is not what our Bill of Rights is all about. That's about making sure that citizens are treated fairly by their government and the Fourth Amendment's at the core of that. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to uh, hold the second part of this question, which I think is also an important question that I wanna to get to, um, but I'm gonna take a, a very recently submitted question and put it here because uh, the question was, what are the arguments against this amendment? I think that we just talked through one of them. So I wanted to switch it up a little bit and say, um, what other arguments against the amendment, uh, I suppose, have you heard um, or do you uh, wanna comment on? I actually think that might be the big one that we, we just talked through, but just to open the floor. I'm Honestly, happy to just... I, I don't hear many people trying to defend this on its merits. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Chris, you yeah, want to I'll jump just, in? Yeah, I'll just echo what I said at the top, which is, you know, the government obviously um, argues that it needs access to this information without a warrant. Um, but as in other situations, um, especially in light of the ODNI report, if the government does not understand what it is purchasing or what it is using for, I, I think you know, I think those arguments about value, short of transparency, short about a common understanding and inventory about what data purchases are being made, I think those value propositions are are flimsy to say the least. And I'll just go and piggyback off of uh, Chris there, where when we're talking about the the value of the data, it certainly when it's when it's tenuous at best sometimes in terms of what the actual end result might be it certainly raises questions about the efficacy of the overarching practice i think that it is fair to recognize that yes that the data collection aspect for law enforcement is one way that they do intelligence gathering but let's not pretend that it's also the exclusive or only way that they do it they do have other tools at their disposal lord knows they love to use them and that's totally fine um i think that that's a separate conversation but I think that you you got to recognize that with all this data that you're purchasing, that there's a lot of noise in that data, right? Like, how do you understand what data is valuable, what data is not valuable, what's important to look at? Some of this stuff that that is being collected by data brokers, like from a traditional marketing perspective, is completely benign, um, and it might not even have all that much value from a law enforcement perspective. Um, I think like, you know, if we're looking at, let's say, genealogical data, for example, we know that law enforcement, certainly at the state levels, looked at trying to uh, use that for genealogical searches. And one study found that only 17% of all those searches actually turned into something that was useful for law enforcement. But that's a lot of resources being mustered by law enforcement to go and chase down something in the name of just, you know, having the cool new toy. So sometimes you'll hear law enforcement say that you're taking away a tool. And I don't think that that's true at all. I think that if anything, you're actually helping them better utilize the tool if they're going to be using it by having some established guardrails and best practices that can go and govern how they go about doing this, if they're going to be doing it at all. Right. right. And, 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 and in, in that regard, the fact that this data is even available so that the government can get a warrant or depending on the kind of data, it may be a different type of court order, but, but the fact that it's even available, they're still coming out ahead, right? If you go back two decades, certainly three decades, none of this, would have been available to the government at all, with or without a warrant, right? We are in a brave new world where this stuff is even available. So for the government to come in and say, there's no way we can fight crime without this. Well, look, we have 200 years of this country's history to say otherwise, because this is new. Um, and again, with the fact they can, that they can actually access this with, with appropriate legal process, they're coming out ahead. Yeah, and, and to add to what James said, uh, the, the, you, the pieces of information by themselves may not seem all that meaningful or relevant, but if you gather data from hundreds of sources, 
and put it together and use artificial intelligence to sort through it, you can create a composite of a person that uh, provides more information about that individual than any one who's uh, an acquaintance of that person would possibly even know about them. Uh, and that is just a massive intrusion into their lives, all for something that doesn't even require warrant. And we're not saying that if you can buy data from uh, a source and the government uh, gets authorization through a court order, through a warrant, uh, to go ahead and get that, fine, go ahead and do that. But to simply buy data, whether it's targeted to a, an individual or uh, a massive sweep of information that they're simply buying and storing uh, for use and then later uh, collating and, uh, and sorting in ways that uh, they might find useful in whatever purpose the government might have. It might be a criminal investigation, but it might be uh, involving tax collection, or it might be involving uh, trying to determine uh, who visits uh, Planned Parenthood clinics, or it might involve who visits gun shops. I mean, there's so much information here that we should be concerned about how government accesses it. Uh, thank you all so much. I think those, you know, knit profoundly uh, impactfully together. Um, I, I wanted to just offer one more thing. I was also thinking about what, what James said is, uh, you know, I, for any staffers who were working these issues, uh, you know, I guess three plus years ago, the three to four years ago era, um, we had a, a different, uh, this is a FISA sunset year around section 702. That was the last FISA sunset fight, which was around section 215. Um, the government showed up to that fight, you know, uh, really insisting that if that authority uh, expired for even a second, there would be uh, catastrophic national security implications. It turned out, as has already been referenced, that that was a largely duplicative authority. And in fact, a lot of the same records that the government could have acquired there are the kind that are for sale now from data brokers. Um, so, you know, I think, I guess I just want to pull out that the importance of, of viewing the government's claims around these things skeptically, because as you've heard, uh, you know, the government says that there's some intelligence value to bu buying this information, but do we have clear examples? Do your bosses have but for examples of, of where this has protected national security? Um, how much of this is duplicative? Uh, and to, to, at the end of the day, how much of this is the government running around rules that otherwise would, would protect uh, the privacy of people in the United States? Um, uh, thank you all so much for that. Uh, I'm going to get us to the next couple of questions that have come in. So um, one, um, this does this amendment uh, include protections for non-US citizens uh, or could intelligence services continue to purchase their data? Um, I want to open this up. Does anybody want to jump on this? I can if not, but the, Liza, well, the, so the, the language of the amendment uh, has to do with records of US, U, US persons or persons inside the United States. Uh, so those are the people um, for whom constitutional protections would apply. It does not apply to non-U.S. persons. It does not apply to uh, people who are not citizens who are located overseas. Uh, and, and I feel the need to uh, elaborate on this for a moment, Eliza, feel free to jump back in if you like. But um, we have seen, and in fact, there was a critical moment during the Section 215 de uh, uh, debate that I was just uh, mentioning, um, that if you want to protect the privacy of, of, of uh, U.S. citizens in the United States, you need to protect the privacy of everyone in the United States. Uh, the possibility of saying, well, they're in the U.S., but we don't know, is uh, it turns out a giant loophole that we've seen exploited in other contexts. And so it's very important if you're trying to say you can't buy information about Americans, really the only way to effectively say that is uh, you can't buy information about people in the United States. Um, so just to, to explain that or extrapolate a little bit there. Um, right, Sean, Sean, if I can interrupt, if, please, if, you please. Buy, if you buy a database, it often doesn't come with a guide that says this person's a U.S. citizen, this person's not. Uh, so if you're going to if you're going to protect American citizens, uh, you're going to have to take that into account. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, next question we had uh, come in. Uh, the amendment appears to limit the purchase of data by law enforcement or intelligence agencies. What about them quietly receiving it from other agencies like USPS, uh, which is collecting contracts, monitoring social media, and collecting biometric data? It's a great question. I, I'm happy to jump in, you know, it, first to just plug, you know, my colleagues at Epic you know, have done fantastic work around USPS. So for, for anyone who's interested, you should absolutely 
Um, look at our website, you know, I will just flag something that the ODNI report I think does note very well is any comprehensive understanding of government data purchases has to both include a data direct, you know, an agency directly purchasing data, as well as, you know, it calls them functionally equivalent um, procurement processes. So this is where agencies acquire commercially available information, but don't purchase it directly. You know, so USPS, for example, might buy data and then share it with another agency. Um, so this is certainly part of the issue. You know, it, it certainly doesn't get to the broader government data flows um, where one agency, instead of purchasing information, is directly collecting it itself. Um, that's certainly an issue that Epic cares deeply about, um, but, but is a little bit out of scope for this amendment. So, so the amendment does have um, does state that non law enforcement non intelligence agencies uh, can purchase anonymized data um, as long as that data cannot be reasonably re identified um, and that provision is in there because uh, we've seen there have been a lot of studies showing um, that it in a lot of cases is very easy for. Uh, the government to re-identify information that has supposedly been anonymized. So uh, the amendment includes a provision that says that the that the data has to be rigorously uh, anonymized in such a way that it cannot be reasonably re-identified. In such cases, that that information uh, can go to uh, non-law enforcement, non-intelligence agencies, but those agencies are prohibited from further sharing that information with law enforcement and intelligence agencies. If I can just follow up on, a, I, I think, Liza's point about, you know, so-called anonymized data is a key one, you know, and the government's position clearly, you know, the ODNI report says agencies, at least some of the intelligence agencies have basically taken the position, well, is it's anonymized if we don't intend to re-identify the data, which to me is, you know, a, you know, we'll just... Fingers crossed, we won't reuse this to identify you, um, so we don't need to protect it like we would other sensitive data. And I, I think that's clearly, um, the report says, unacceptably narrow definition uh, of um, sensitive data. Um, and I think even more cause for oversight and, and reform. Thank you all. Um, I am going to offer a, a quick thought uh, related to the last question and what I'm going to invite the, the panel to uh, opine on next, which is uh, a key takeaway, something that they think everybody in this panel should uh, take from this, or everybody in the audience should take away from this panel discussion. Um, to uh and while we do that if anybody has any remaining questions please put them in we'll stay around for as long as folks can after um these closing thoughts uh and try to get to anything uh left and then in any event if you have any questions after this panel please do not hesitate to reach out to any and all of us um we're eager to to help however we can um so uh my closing thought uh to kick us off um really just it actually comes from that last question i think that there is not only in this amendment but in the broader uh fight around warrantless surveillance this year that is the section 702 fight um members of congress congress itself has a huge opportunity uh it has an opportunity that may not exist anywhere else in such a bipartisan format uh it's the kind of opportunity that uh many folks in this community have been fighting for for years including leaders on the hill leading this amendment um there is a moment for congress to uh fight for comprehensive action on these issues uh, uh these critical key issues of privacy i think the panelists have done an amazing job uh, you know explaining why uh, now is the time including that it's going to be uh that it's going to get worse um before it gets better um and so congress uh you know it to the extent Congress is not behind the ball right now on this issue, um, this may be the last chance to, 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 to keep up with, with the developments that are coming at us um, almost like a fire hose. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Like I said, I want to turn to all of the, each of the panelists now and ask them for something that they think that you should be taking away from this conversation. Um, I don't have a strong thought about who goes first. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to start with Kia because it's been a minute since we've heard from Kia. Um, and again, anybody who's got any remaining questions, please put them in and we'll turn back around to, to questions and answers for as long as we can on the other side of this. Uh, and thank you again to everybody who was able to join us um, both on and off the panel. Kia. 
Thank, thank you, Sean. I mean, I, I think the big takeaway I would say this issue really is Pandora's box. Like, if we don't address this now, it there are all, all kinds of unanticipated abuses that we may see in the coming years. You know, I, I think when you think about the use of AI and, and to, to to look at mass quantities of data that's been purchased by the government, there's all kinds of potential problems that we we could have. And and this is a really good opportunity to to, to this year. It's a very good opportunity to, to, to try and address this problem and kind of head off all those th those abuses. Um, and, you know, and, and obviously it, it, is, it is more convenient for the government to be able to buy this kind of data. But the Fourth Amendment is not about convenience and it's not about making the job, the government's job easier. It's a constitutional protection that's there um, that they we are supposed to be there to protect us. Thank you, Kia. Um, James, do you want to take us next? Yeah, sure. I think that. Um, the big thing to take away from this at the, at the, end, at the end of the day is that um, kind of like Kia was mentioning, this is a problem that's only going to continue to grow. It's not going away. And as digital natives come online, it's just going to proliferate even more. Uh, as, as Liza kind of highlighted with, um, with, with the case law, you know, this is some place where Congress can go and act. Don't ask the courts to do it. We're going to be stuck years trying to litigate that out. Otherwise, I think that there's a, it's great that we have a bipartisan group of people on the Hill and a bipartisan group of organizations that are supportive of this amendment. And don't forget that part. I mean, this isn't some highly partisan issue. This is something where a lot, a broad swath of people uh, recognize and have identified the problem. And now it's our time to go and actually take action to solve that problem that's been identified. Thank you, James. And um, I'm just gonna flag what you already referenced and something that Liza did a good job explaining before. You know. Uh, it's we're, we're five years after the Carpenter decision. So you're exactly right. We've got how many years until the court faces again these issues? And then we're assuming that, you know, within five years, there's comprehensive guidance issued when, of course, we have unfortunately only evidence to the contrary. So the idea that the courts are going to get us to where um, where the American public perhaps expects the, this policy discussion to be, um, I think is, is indeed a, a risky proposition. Um, Liza, would you like to go next? Sure. I want to pick up on something you said, Sean, which is that this is an opportunity. This is an exciting opportunity. Uh, there's a problem here that everybody understands on a gut level. Um, there's a solution that is elegant and simple uh, that will go very, very far with just a few words. Um, and there's broad bipartisan support, not just sort of from the far left and the far right or the center left and the center right across the ideological spectrum. We have support for this solution. So it is so rare that those factors come together. Um, and I, I really hope that Congress is going to seize this opportunity to do something really, really meaningful uh, for the for the privacy of Americans so that Americans can, can, tr can trust that Congress is protecting our reasonable expectations of privacy. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Goodlatte. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Sean for putting this together uh, with Demand Progress and for Liza and James and Kia and Chris for their great contribution to this as well. I hope that this presentation has convinced um, all of you who are, who are <coughs> uh, viewing this program that this is something that the Congress needs to act on and it needs to act on now. And if you do agree with that, I hope you'll take this opportunity uh, to let um, leadership in both parties, let the Rules Committee know that this very important amendment needs to be made in order as a part of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, as was noted here, uh, one of the uh, entities that is purchasing uh, data is the Defense Intelligence Agency. It's very much pertinent uh, to the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, and it is something that I think the Congress needs to take control of, needs to set a, an important policy that makes it very clear that purchasing data is not an acceptable workaround to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. Um, we've had two questions come in, but uh, in case anybody has to go, I just want to thank everybody in the audience for tuning in one more time. Um, and uh, I understand as well, if the anybody on the panel needs to run, uh, don't worry about it. But um, I'm going to try to address these two questions before we sign off. Um, so the first one is, uh, if this amendment is adopted, is it equally enforceable and protective as a law passed by Congress? Anybody want to jump in? This would be a law passed by Congress. 
Thank you. It would be incorporated into the National Defense Authorization Act, and as such, it would it would have the complete force of law. Thank you. Um, and then next up, um, uh, I actually may take a first whack at this, but I'll invite others to to jump in if uh, if they want to add. Um, the question is, uh, how do we determine what qualifies as an agency? Um, would a non-law enforcement or intelligence agency include agencies that aren't traditionally law enforcement or intelligence, but have developed teams or groups uh, within individual agencies that utilize uh, intelligence? And, and and this is a great question because uh, some of the stories that you will see about this and some of the earlier reporting about um, about these data purchases come from some entity that you've never heard of that's underneath some other entity that you would never have thought was doing anything in uh, surveillance, uh, much less surveillance of people in the United States. Um, I just want to quickly ask the technical or answer the technical question before handing it over. Uh, the amendment is written uh, in part uh, uh, as a prohibition or I should say a warrant requirement um, where it's uh, the data is being acquired for law enforcement purposes or intelligence purposes. And so by tying it there, um, there's a boot and suspenders approach to this amendment, uh, so so there's a little bit more to say, but um, in any event, uh, to answer that question, uh, any agency could conceptually be buying information for uh, one of those purposes. That's what triggers the the, the prohibition or the warrant requirement. Um, does, does anybody else want to jump in on this, though? Yeah, no, that's that's right, Sean, for, for sort of for one half of the amendment, and as Sean said, it is sort of belt and suspenders. There, there's another part of the amendment that talks about intelligence and law enforcement agencies. And it is true that the question of uh, what constitutes an intelligence agency uh, might there that there could you could imagine there'd be some some potential room for mischief there. And if this were limited to intelligence agencies, I think you might want to define that more clearly. However, any of the agencies that we're concerned about, to the extent they, they don't consider themselves or they decide not to consider themselves in intelligence agencies, they would qualify as law enforcement agencies. So I think having those two together, you're going to capture the universe of the agencies that, that we're concerned about. But I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk more about that offline. Thank you, Liza. Um... Thank you again to all of our panelists. I'm gonna answer the final question as we sign out because somebody helpfully asked, will this video be accessible later? Uh, if you or anybody else wants uh, uh, the recording of this video, I believe all you'll have to do after this point is go to the same link, uh, also RSVP, but RSVPing will produce a link for you to view this video. So please feel free to continue uh, or to, to, to revisit it in that format. Please email me or anyone else on the panel if you run into any issues at all with that or any of the substance here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. hopefully we'll have even more people viewing um, after the fact. But uh, thank you again to uh, all of the staffers in particular who were able to make time for this. Thank you very much to the panelists um, for the great conversation. Uh, and with that, I will leave you all to the rest of your busy weeks uh, and good luck as the NDAA continues. <laughs>